only on Bloomberg Quint. Welcome back. You're watching Indian Open right here on Bloomberg Quint Live. For Asia, the pocket is doing okay for itself this Monday morning. We've got uh, green shoots across the screen. Japan is up a whole percent. You've got Shanghai and Hang Seng with gains of about half an odd percent apiece. SGX Nifty, though, is lying flat. No major moves coming in from there. But individual pockets are something that you're going to be closely watching out for, particularly telecom, which is going to be the big mover in today's session. And not just telecom. The fact that this is a, comes as a big relief to the industry, it comes as a big relief to the lenders as well, Neeraj. Yeah, actually, I was about to say that banks, and banks for more reasons than one, not just yes, not just RBL, but because of the telcos. Yep, and the fact that we've had a positive monthly close and we've had a positive weekly, weekly close. close. All of those factors all go well to see whether or not this structure maintains itself and takes us forward from yep. here or no. But one element that also supports that theory is what happens in the derivative space. So let's go across to Agam Vakil to find out uh, whether or not uh, you know, you could actually land up seeing more longs in the upcoming days. Uh, Agam, good morning. Well, that's a very important point, Devina. Good morning. Well, uh, what we've seen last Friday was a lot of unwinding. So, uh, I suppose what really needs to be seen now is that whether or not that long unwinding can change. As you can see, there's been a decline in open interest for the Nifty, and this is on the first day of a new series. And the Nifty banking future is also seeing a decline of as much as 9%. What about the levels that we are watching out for? In terms of change in open interest, we saw a lot of writing around the 12,100, 12,200, 12,300 calls. Now, this may very well change. This picture may very well change into writing of puts should we see some strength in today's day of trade. And well, we have a lot of resistance around the 12,000 put. Uh, don't forget, we are around that mark right now. So it's going to be tested, but there is still a significant amount of uh, put uh, writing there. The wicks came off to below the mark of 14, and the put call ratio also really didn't change too much. But in terms of the, the stocks that we're watching out for, besides telecommunications, we'll have a Yes Bank in focus along with RVL. Both of them are in the FNO uh, well, uh, space. Adani Ports did see a lot of strength uh, coming in. In terms of stocks which are seeing unwinding, let's bring that up as well. India Bulls Housing Finance, Union Bank of India, along with LNT Finance Holding, uh, looking at uh, well, some unwinding. Again, all eyes will be on the telecommunications sector today and also how markets react in general to uh, the GDP data that we've got over the weekend. Okay, Agam, thanks so much for putting that into perspective. So we'll watch out for all of these as well. And then let's now start getting in voices and an impact voice on all of the key names that you got to monitor in the session today. There is Telecom, there is Yes Bank and RPL Bank, there is Banks at Large and a clutch of other names which were in focus on Friday's session. Start off with Avinash Gorak, Shekhar, a quick perspective from him, Head of Research at John Dr. Capital Services on the show. Avinash, good morning. Thanks so much for joining in. Um, does the whole event around Yes Bank raise more questions than answer them? And therefore, what does it mean for the stock today or over the near term? Uh, I think Neeraj clearly uh, looking at the kind of uh, profile of the investors who have shown interest. I would uh, believe that you know the markets would obviously be looking at it uh, from a slightly cautious tone considering the fact that not many P uh, players or many corporates who actually earlier expressed interest uh, you know those names have not come up and most importantly you know the pricing is going to be the key element. Uh, I would believe that you know the stock may not run up in a hurry because obviously uh, RBI approval for one or two players is going to be very crucial considering the threshold uh, what RBI has mentioned. So I would believe that you know uh, the markets would obviously be divided considering the fact that uh, when this money actually comes in, what is the pricing and obviously whether these two big investors who have actually expressed interest, especially the Canadian investor, I would believe that you know that could be a clearly a kind of a resistance point at least in the near term. I would believe that maybe it would be still be a couple of months away before we could see a big re-rating. There's no doubt that Yes Bank requires a lot of capital to survive and if they do get it, I think then the next phase of growth could uh, definitely happen provided you know incremental asset quality doesn't deteriorate. Mm -hmm. That's an important point though. Uh, you know, a market seems to be a bit divided 
uh, with regards to uh, how much of an upside can that give to Yes Bank right now. But the other pocket, obviously, aside from Yes Bank and RBL Bank on the back of fundraising, is what's happening in the telecom space. Airtel and Vodafone Idea unveiled new and costlier prepaid plans on Sunday, with Ryan's Geo announcing a tentative tariff hike of 40%. Let's discuss the implications with Naveen Kulkarni, Head of Research at Reliance Securities. Uh, Naveen, thanks very much for taking out the time. Let's uh, talk about it. The initial impact, obviously, much positive for a Vodafone and Idea. Uh, an EBITDA improvement, ARPU gets pushed to higher as well. I think for Bharti now, it stands closer to 138. Vodafone comes, pushes itself a notch up to 117, uh, 115 odd. Uh, do you feel it's already built in and factored in? See, uh, so in case of, let's say, <coughs> Bharti to some extent, uh, it's gotten built in. Uh, the case for Vodafone Idea is different. So the case for Vodafone Idea was, uh, was about survival. So this gives it a much better fighting chance than what it was, right? So from that perspective, there is a chance of uh, some equity value creation for uh, Vodafone Idea because otherwise it was pretty much written off that uh, uh, over a period of some time, uh, they will not be able to fulfill their uh, debt obligations. So that is the case for Vodafone Idea. In case of Bharti, what happens is that uh, the tariff hike is still higher than expectations. So that provide some bit of a fillip even at current price level. So I would say that probably 15 to 20% was factored in uh, the current uh, 25 to 30% the blended basis, which I think the uh, uh, tariffy could work out to, is not uh, factored in. But on the other hand, the thesis of a two-player market also uh, shrinks a bit, right? So, so there are some uh, there are there are mild negatives for Bharti in that sense, but otherwise, overall on a holistic basis, it's a big positive for the industry as a whole. Mm. Naveen, uh, what's the uptick in EBITDA do you envisage? I mean, various notes uh, peg it between about 30 to 35 odd percent for Bharti. Is that a fair estimate? And therefore, what does it do to target multiples? See, uh, that should be the that should be the fair multiple. Uh, they should be the fair estimate, right? So because incrementally, whatever uh, uh, it could even be higher uh, because the incremental EBITDA which gets generated from the tariff hikes uh, tends to be higher. So, uh, so a 30 to 40 percent kind of EBITDA increase whenever this thing fully fact gets factored in is something which can be expected. See the tariff multiple. Uh, sorry, the uh, the uh, uh, valuation multiple for uh, Bharti was always uh, has been higher on the higher side because the market was valuing it on a uh, uh, on a multiple which was essentially based on uh, a stressed EBITDA case, right? So you buy it at uh, bottom of the cycle at a higher multiple and probably sell it at uh, uh, top of the cycle at a lower multiple, right? So that's the theme which. Uh, uh, people were working on with Bharti. So I don't think so. There is a, there is going to be any material improvement in the uh, valuation multiple that uh, Bharti enjoys. If it happens, then I would be a little surprised at this point in time. Uh, my sense is that the stock uh, will react a little lesser than what the uh, earnings accretion or what the EBITDA accretion will be over a period of, let's say, next three to four months because market will wait on what actually happens in terms of how much tariffs are getting absorbed and whether they are transiting into numbers, after that, also, what uh, the spectrum, uh, sorry, the AGR payout that the uh, uh, company makes. So there are other factors also which the market will have to take cognizance of. What does this do with regards to what uh, you know the TRAI does? Do you feel that there could be any intervention with regards to flow pricing and you know the kind of increases that uh, the players have come out with? See, the problem with the uh, 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 floor pricing is that. Uh, it's a very, very difficult regulation to implement because uh, what does happen in telecom is that uh, voice and data are pretty much co-mingled in, in a 4G kind of an ecosystem, right? So even voice calls can uh, transpire through a data mechanism, right? So that's where the challenge will be. So if somebody is doing a WhatsApp call, then it should be counted as data and whether you, you need to introduce the four plus plan for that or not, right? So that's a very, very difficult regulation for uh, the 
regulator to implement. Uh, at this point in time, I think uh, they are uh, uh, looking at uh, a, a mechanism where uh, the industry corrects itself in terms of pricing so that the industry starts making uh, uh, some bit of, uh, uh, I would say, that uh, uh, returns. Uh, however, uh, over a long-term period, whether I see a permanent implication or uh, implementation of a floor price mechanism, I would doubt that at this point in time. All right, um, Naveen, thanks very much for joining us this morning and sharing your Thank thoughts you. with us on the latest move by some of these telecom operators to increase tariffs and the uh, impact of that on EBITDA, ARPU improvement that happens. Uh, should, augur, should augur well. Let's wait and watch. Avinash, quick 30-second view, if you can, on Reliance Industries uh, as well, because they've said that they might, they will do the hikes uh, this week. No, I think it definitely is good news for uh, Reliance Industries. I think with a larger subscriber base, uh, a 40 percent hike in tariffs would obviously add significantly to the EBITDA. But I think what is important, Neeraj, is going forward, you know, one would uh, have to have a look as how price sensitive is now going to be data availability because obviously uh, such a steep hike, I think uh, cannot be, one cannot rule out the fact that possibly, you know, if uh, this hike is not absorbed by the consumers, there could be some amount of resistance from the customers in terms of, you know, their usage going forward. Mm. Okay, I mean, Ashish, so much more to talk about as well. Let's take it to our research team now to talk about the other key newsmakers as well as um, the auto sales. Uh, they got lost in the uh, noise because of a clutch of other news flow out here. But Nikki and Yatin join in to talk about that. Good morning to both of you. Yatin, auto sales. Now, what do you make of it? Because uh, the headline numbers for maybe a Maruti and a Tata Motors slightly better, but yeah. I mean, is it good enough? So, uh, Neeraj, uh, as you are mentioning, uh, the festive season sales were good. Uh, there was a pickup, uh, you know, uh, in the Diwali period. However, post the Diwali period, uh, you know, auto sales uh, have been not that great. Uh, so, don't purely go by the November numbers, uh, you know, since uh, December is expected to be slightly uh, weaker. And seasonally also, if you see, since it's year end, uh, nobody usually buys cars. So, uh, seasonally, uh, obviously, December would be, uh, be slower. Uh, but talking about the November auto sales numbers, they have been slightly better than the street expectations, at least for Maruti as well as uh, Tata Motors. Maruti's total sales were down 2% to come in at 1.5 lakh units. Our uh, Bloomberg Quint poll was close to 1.47 uh, lakh units, so broadly in line with expectations. If you look at Mahindra and Mahindra also, uh, their auto sales were down 9% uh, to come in at 41,000 units. Again, broadly in line with expectations, their to overall tractor sales were down 19%. Uh, which came in at 21,000 uh, units odd, it's lower than expectations by 10%. Uh, so the tractor sales really disappointed. However, the management does expect that the rubby season uh, will lead to pick up <coughs> as far as uh, uh, you know tractor sales are concerned. And finally, Tata Motors uh, is uh, uh, one uh, company to watch out for. That the overall sales were down 25% uh, to come in at 41,000 odd units. However, it was much better uh, than the expectation number of close to 38,000 units. So. Uh, Tata Motors and Maruti have surprised the street, uh, you know, on the upside. And if you look at uh, the overall, uh, uh, you know, expectations as far as uh, two-wheelers are concerned, uh, watch out for Bajaj Auto. Uh, we are expecting a flattish kind of a number here. Four lakh units is what uh, the Bloomberg Quint poll is throwing up as far as estimates are concerned for Bajaj uh, Auto. Hero Motor Corp also, uh, the numbers uh, would look slightly lower. Uh, we have uh, the wholesale which will uh, remain muted on the back of weak retail sales. Uh, total sales seen at close to uh, 5.37 lakh units, <coughs> down nearly 11.9%. TVS Motors, on the other hand, would also show a double-digit uh, kind of a decline. Overall sales uh, number seen at close to 2.9 lakh units. And if you look at Royal Enfield, watch out for this one. Uh, for the last uh, you know one or two months, we have seen great pickup here. Uh, we have the overall numbers, uh, according to the Bloomberg Quint poll, uh, to be at close to uh, 68,000 units, and that will be an increase of 3.2%. So Royal Enfield is one number again uh, that, will I, uh, that I would watch out for as far as November sales data is concerned. So the one standout is Royal Enfield and Aisha Motors, you think? Yeah. So, uh, you know, clearly last month was a growth number. This time, again, the expectation is of a growth number. Uh, they are looking at, uh, you know, ad spends. Uh, if you look at the weekend papers, you know, most of them had a front page ad of Royal Enfield. Prices have come down, uh, you know, for most of these cream products. 
so hopefully uh, you know sales should pick up uh, there is some you know internal campaign to boost sales and uh, you know not only uh, domestic but exports, exports okay. uh, so let's see how really royal enfield uh, shapes up for the month of november okay so that's the i mean of, of the few numbers that are still anticipated we'll watch out for this one let's see if it stands out or no but i think clearly believing that that's the number to watch out for nikki what about the other stocks in news uh, not many actually i'll start off with rbl bank that's the major one uh, the bank is uh, planning to raise around 825 crore uh, preferential allotment uh, Earlier on November 27th, Bloomberg Quint had reported that the bank is planning to raise 1,500 crore. That would be through a mix of preferential as well as QIP. We wait to see if QIP round is yet to come. Uh, at this point of time, the share is more than 2 crore shares. The share is being offered at a price of around 340 per share. Uh, this seems to be a little lower, 8 to 10 percent lower as compared to the previous market price. Uh, in terms of the investors, there are a couple of them. Bajaj Finance, Eastbridge Capital and FEG Mauritius are some among them. Uh, also, we're looking at Coal India because uh, that company has reported the November production as well as the sales number. Seems to be that the production woes are seem to be receding for this counter right now, which is a great positive. Uh, if you look at the production numbers, they're up by as much as 27 percent month on month basis. Sales, uh, where well, uptake there is also visible, 17 percent uptake month on month basis. But if you look at year on year basis, uh, that's a decline coming in there, 4 percent on production front and 8 percent downtake on the offtake front. Decline in offtake is uh, on account of lower demand from power sector. Uh, next on the list, we have DHFL, where RBI has filed in an insolvency proceeding uh, against the company. And last on the list, we're looking at Adani and JMR Group. Seems to be a little sit, uh, setback for this, uh, both of these counters, given that Zurich uh, Airport uh, has outpicked Adani as well as JMR Consortium to develop Saver Airport as well. Mm. Okay, we'll watch out for these as well. Thanks a lot for that, Nikki, as well as Yatin. <laughs> Avinash, just a very quick perspective on RBL Bank. What do you expect the stock to do? Uh, I think the fundraising has been uh, quite successful and I think uh, despite the fact that you know the number uh, collected has slight, been slightly lower than what the street expected, I would believe that uh, Neeraj, I think clearly uh, funding is going to be very critical for RBL Bank and I think uh, despite the fact that December quarter may not be a great quarter considering that they have already indicated some stress on the SME loan book, I would believe that FY21 could be a lot better with fresh funding and obviously incremental asset quality uh, coming back to you know normal levels. I would believe that you know this could be a definitely be a stock to watch out for, and most importantly, you know, I, if asset quality stabilizes for FY21, then we could see definitely a gradual re-rating here. But definitely, I mean, uh, the fundraising has been quite uh, successfully done, and that definitely augurs well for the stock. Okay, it's RBL Bank, uh, 374 on the stock. Last three months has not done badly. It's actually picked up quite a bit. Uh, you know, in in the, between uh, November, October, and November, so the stock uh, actually from those lows of about 250, climbed all the way to about 374. Let's also bring in our technical experts, Ashish Chathamotha, Head of Technical and Derivative at Sanctum Wealth, is joining us along with him, Richard Jain, Technical Analyst at Angel Broking. Gentlemen, good morning to both of you. Ashish, let me come to you first. Uh, you know, how, how positive is the reading that we've had, actually had a positive close on a monthly and a weekly basis last week? Uh, uh, good morning, Devina. So I think, uh, see, broadly the markets are in a very positive uh, territory. We have seen some profit booking on uh, Friday's trading session, but, you know, after hitting an all-time high, this is going to be a normal phenomena where every third day you might see some intraday dip or maybe a, a profit booking, but broadly the uh, structure of the market is good. If you look at the data, clearly there is a strong put writing uh, taking place in the range of 11,800, and even at 12,000 levels, we are seeing reasonable amount of put writing uh, happening. Uh, so I think I um, think uh, with a stop below 11,850-900, positionally we, we feel that index is heading towards 12,350 to 400 uh, mark and any dip is an opportunity to, to be on the long side of the trade. So I think this Friday's profit booking can uh, should be used as an opportunity to initiate a long, keeping 11,950 uh, as a stop loss for, for a very short term traders, 12,250 could be a short term upside which one can expect at an index level. Okay. Uh, Ruchi Jen, uh, what about you? What's going to be your call on the index and what kind of positioning would you take? Yeah, hi, very good morning to everyone. Well, uh, if you look at the entire month of November, then uh, initially for the first two or three weeks, we have seen a consolidation in the range of uh, 11,850 to 12,050. But finally, during the expiry week, we see we saw a breakout beyond this range, and this has led to continuation of the uptrend, which we have been seeing in the formation of high-top, high-bottom structure. 
Now on every decline, the 20 days exponential moving average has been acting as a support and still there are no signs of reversal. In fact, the closing on the monthly on the weekly charts is, uh, uh, is still quite positive. So we are advising to take a buy on dip strategy for the index 11, uh, 12,000 now seem to be a very good support for intraday today. So if any intraday decline we get towards 12,000 on nifty spot levels, one can use that decline as a buying opportunity. Go long around 12,000 for positional basis with the stop loss below 11,880 and we are expecting 12,200 levels in next one week. Okay, in light of that then, what are the strategies, <laughs> stock specific strategies? Ashish, I'll come to you first, the ideas for the morning. Yeah, morning. So um, I think the first idea would be on the long side of uh, uh, you know State Bank of India. This is one stock which has which has seen a very strong OI build up in last couple of trading sessions, and I think uh, you know um, after consolidating for almost nine years, we are seeing some strong renewed buying interest coming back to uh, State Bank of India. So here one can initiate a long 338 would be my trading stop loss on upside 362 is a short term target one can expect in uh, State Bank of India. Uh, second is a long call on PVR. Again, the stock has been consolidating for last couple of few weeks uh, after hitting an all-time high and in, on Friday's trading session we have seen a strong uh, you know price volume activity as well as a, a rise in open interest uh, uh, in PVR on the long side so one can initiate a long year 1780 would be my trading stop loss 1860 1870 is a short term target one can expect in PVR and cash segment call is Gujarat gas which I earlier also recommended in your show it has hit an all-time high on uh, Friday's trading session and I think this is one stock where we are seeing very strong delivery volume so one can initiate a long 200 would be my uh, trading stop loss 245 is a short term target one can expect in Gujarat gas in a in a week's time okay hmm. those are some stock ideas uh... Richard your ideas for the morning a <coughs> uh, couple of buy recommendations first is a buy call in Lupin well, after six months of consolidation, we have seen a breakout during last week in Lupin uh, no, from, a, from a falling trend line resistance and the breakout was also accompanied by very good volumes. So although you know, the pharma space have shown some signs of revival, revival and we expect Lupin show, to show some outperformance now. So short term traders can buy Lupin even at current levels which stop below 782 for near term target of 845. And uh, within the PSU banking basket, Union Bank, we are uh, you know, recommending to go long on uh, around current levels of 63 itself. Well, uh, the stock has uh, uh, shown an up move with very good volumes also a breakout from an inverted head and shoulders pattern can be seen technically which is a trend reversal pattern so one can go along on union bank for short term with stock below 56 targets around 75 all right those are some stock ideas that are coming in from our technical experts also time now to go on to our special segment bloomberg edge where yashapadia tells us about a pattern that the bloomberg terminal has thrown up on a particular stock yash what's the stock today Morning, Devina. So we're looking at PVR and there's a buy signal coming in on the back of the Trender indicator, which is a proprietary Bloomberg indicator. Uh, the Trender, as you know, is basically uses the spread between the two weighted moving averages and uses the true range uh, for the purpose of calculation and generating a buy or a sell signal. It also helps you manage your stop loss. How do you interpret it? You basically go long when the Trender line uh, uh, changes its color from red to green and you go short when it changes its color from green to red. When does that color change happen? When the price moves above a certain mark which is where the trender is and that's what has happened when it comes to PVR as well because uh, the red line which is the trender line that had been around the mark of 1800 uh, and it has successfully closed above that mark uh, with the kind of gains that we've seen over the last three days which has resulted in that change in color uh, but not just on the trender uh, again uh, taking a look at some uh, uh, some uh, you know patterns that are forming on the charts and again we are seeing that it has managed to break out from its uh, from its symmetrical triangle pattern so as you could see the yellow lines over here they form the triangle and it has managed to break above that and most importantly it has managed to do so on the back of high volumes as well uh, so on Friday's day of trade we saw this big uh, spike in volumes and on the back of which we saw the stock move up as well and we've seen the gains come in for the last three successive trading sessions there is a strong support around the mark of uh, the yellow line which is there uh, so clearly there is momentum on the upside the trend line changing its color to green uh, there's high volume based pickup uh, in the stock price uh, so watch out for PVR on the long side okay uh and how well has this worked in the past, Yash? So they've been a three out of the last five times that the trender has given a positive call. On an average, over the next one month period, the stock has managed to run up close to around 7%, uh, which comes up to almost uh, its new all-time high for the stock. Okay, got that. Yash, thanks very much for that. Uh, so that is PVR for you. Uh, watch out for that one. Nonetheless, uh, you know, the other one um, that we'd like to talk to you about, Avinash, and, you know, since we already have a trade on SPI, let's talk about the fundamentals of some of these larger PSU names. 
Uh, I think clearly within the large cap, uh, you know, PSU banks, SBI and Bank of Baroda, I would believe uh, definitely uh, I expected to show a best asset quality kind of uh, trend. And most importantly, in terms of the incremental asset quality, these numbers could be better. Uh, our sense is that you know the smaller PSU banks still continue to be vulnerable, and I would believe that you know the larger banks itself could provide uh, you know better kind of risk reward bets. Uh, SBI, particularly considering the fact that they have SBI car cards IPO lined up, I think there could be some value value unlocking you know even from this point. But overall, I think the asset quality, the loan book growth, and hopefully you know once the macro numbers improve, uh, you could possibly see better numbers you know from both these frontline banks. Nonetheless, uh, you know, last week was not bad at all for even the smaller PSU banks, which uh, you know propped up in trade. So the likes of Corporation, Union Bank of India, uh, Syndicate Bank, all of these names were very active last week. In the last one month, Corporation is now 40 percent, 7 percent for Union Bank. But I think bulk of the move came in last week and not last month. Uh, but uh, a quick uh, take on any of the Adani Group stocks, uh, Ashish, because. We've seen extreme amount of uh, uh, interest, at least from a uh, price standpoint, for the likes of Adani Green. On Friday's session, most of the Adani Group stocks were active. Yes, yeah, so most of this either demerged companies or you know another newly listed uh, uh, players like Adani Green, Adani Transmission, Adani, uh, you know Gas. They are seeing a very strong uh, you know activity, and if you look at the. Uh, you know the delivery volumes in these stocks they are also picking up very well only thing is they have give, given a phenomenal returns in last couple of few weeks few months so I think the only point is uh, what is the risk reward to go long at these levels that is something very tricky but definitely I think the if you look at from a very short term the momentum is still very intact and what we like is basically the names like Adani transmission which has hit yesterday all time high with, with one of the highest uh, uh, trading volume in a, in a range of almost 18 lakh shares being uh, traded so I think that's one stock where some upside could, could still be witnessed but it, it should be a trading bet because we have already seen the, mm. the stock has seen up move 295 would be my trading stop loss 340 is is an immediate short-term upside which one can expect in the stock. Okay, 10 seconds left to go for market pre-open. We'll be watching out for how, what the Nifty does on the back of what SGX Nifty is doing. Asia is green, but SGX Nifty is absolutely flat. Also keep in mind that your GDP numbers are going to have an impact on the currency as well. And the rupee forward suggesting somewhere closer to 71.81 could be the open for the rupee. But that's the Nifty 50 for you. Uh, you've got about a third of a percent gains coming in there. Uh, Sensex also opening in the positive territory. Individual stocks then, and uh, you know, you have to first focus on the telecom names. Bharti Airtel got a big 10% bump in early morning trade. We'll see whether this sticks. <clears throat> and I just want to look at Reliance Industries, which is up 3% too. That too is up at 1600. And a Vodafone idea should come up to see how it's doing in comparison to the others. And that too is up about 99.5%. Yes, Bank on the back of that fundraising uh, is up 10% too. Uh, the you know, stock's at about 75 now. But again, first trades on these stocks. JSW Steel, 4.5% higher. HCL Tech is up about 2.7%. LNT has moved up. Uh, SBI is at 345, 346 actually. Uh, Sipla has moved up about a percent. Nestle, Grasim, Gale, ICICI Bank at 515 are all showing uh, strains of strength. Maruti, Suzuki, that too actually is trading positive. That quarter of a percent, not too much though. Uh, what's losing up? Z, that's down 5% and that's been hammered last week. Uh, you know, it had moved up but uh, came right back down to under 300 after last week's resignations. BPCL down one and a quarter, m and is down one percent. Tata Steel Tech, Mahindra and NTPC are your top losers in the session. Yeah, and Dish TV too, Devina, you're right, that has corrected quite a bit. So that stock too, and along, along, alongside Z Entertainment, is looking like starting off week in trade. Let's wait and watch. Uh, not too much at the broader end of the spectrum, maybe RBL Bank, one more stock that I want to mark, and then we'll talk at length about some of the others like Telcos. Those are the names that you really need to monitor. RBL Bank too, slightly flattish in the session today. It's important to get one technical perspective on the Telcos and how these four or five names, how do the trade position looks there. Ruchit, now too many names out there, but between the five, which looks the best position? A Vodafone Idea, Bharti Airtel, Bharti Infratel, I'll also put in uh, a Grassim and a Reliance Industries here, which is the best stock technically. 
So, uh, no, if I uh, if I rank them, then top two would be Reliance Industries and Bharti Airtel. Certainly because of the outperformance that these stocks have shown, even when uh, the entire sector was undergoing a lot of volatility. Now, Reliance Industries, uh, now the stock has been continuously forming this high, bot- high top, high bottom structure. And as per the reciprocal retracement theory, the targets for the stock are coming uh, somewhere around 1700, 1720 over, uh, in the short to medium term. So, I think Reliance would be the first pick, uh, where if I have to go long, then uh, one can certainly create long positions for target around 1720 and Bharti Airtel certainly you know this stock is looking quite positive recently we have seen a breakout above 390 400 which was his resistance and during last week we have seen the formation of a bullish flag pattern on the daily chart now once we get a breakout above this flag pattern maybe in today's trading session itself then we could see levels around 500 10 520 which were the earlier highs so Reliance and Bharti these two would be the topics okay Avinash uh, yes bank the way it is looking like starting off seems to suggest that the market likes the fact that there is a fund raised exactly. as opposed to quality of the yeah. uh, people who are coming in my question is if you had if you had an investment or a trading position whatever you may have had in yes bank fundamentally would you take it off the table if the stock indeed starts off say to seven or eight or nine percent higher uh, I think, uh, Neeraj, uh, you know, most of the asset quality concerns have been built in. I think the market is slightly worried on incremental asset quality. And our sense is that, you know, this uh, $2 billion funding, if the company manages to get it, uh, despite the fact that the profile of investors may be a little shaky, I would not be surprised that, you know, around 65 to 70, the stock could consolidate. And obviously, once the funding comes in, there could be a reasonable amount of, uh, you know, interest again coming in. I think uh, markets would obviously look at how, you know, bottom line numbers pan out. But Overall, I don't think you're going to see any further panic sell-off. But overall, I would believe that you know it's going to be a slow ride. At least in the near term, earnings are going to be impacted. We could see only earnings numbers getting a better kind of picture and quality by FY22. So FY21 may see a weaker ROA or a weaker ROE. I think FY22 is something the market should bet on. And to that extent, a price of 65 to 70 for a high-risk investor could definitely be you know preferred, provided he's willing enough to take that kind of call on this bank. All right, high risk investment there on Yes Bank, but may not be a high risk trade though, Ashish. What would you do with that? Uh, see, generally we have, we have avoided this uh, this stock for for a very long, long time. But I think if you look at the structure of the chart, in the, at least in a shorter term or medium term time frame, stock has formed a very good inverted head and shoulder formation, and which indicates that once the stock crosses this 74, 75 area, there is a strong possibility of a stock hitting 95, 200 uh, kind of zone. So I think the risk reward is favorable. Uh, on downside, 64, 63 is going to be a very, very crucial. Uh, support which is basically the low of the right shoulder so keep 63 64 as in stop loss on the closing basis i think yes bank has a potential to see at least 18 20 percent kind of upside from uh, from friday's uh, closing level but it's right. cooling off devina i mean it may look like it is starting off 9 10 percent higher but now just about a percent and a half some gravity yep uh, bharti adal though stays perched at about 10 percent higher now you look at the index itself it's up about eight tenths of a percent but don't go by that because it's just reliance industries which is three percent higher right now and that's the reason why the index is up about three quarters of a percent yeah but it doesn't seem like it's coming on the back of a very weak gdp print is the gdp print also discounted four and a half no news nothing not not unknown and is that also a point out here i i take on board your point completely it's reliance industries which is helping the index well, it doesn't seem like it's coming on the back of a weak GDP print. It's not because, you know, and, and I'm, like I'm saying, why I'm saying Reliance is, is probably because this, this is the only heavyweighted stock. I don't see HDFC Bank anywhere in the top 10 list. Uh, you know, I don't see an Axis Bank there as well. I don't see a Kotak Bank there. Uh, so it's just Reliance Industries. Bharti Airtel is not a very big heavyweight, hmm. though it is. 10% higher, and neither is Grassim or Infratel or UPL or JSW Steel, which are your top five gains. You don't have heavyweights today. participating today, it's Reliance. It's just Reliance, which is chugging along and pulling the index where it is right now. Uh, let's talk about a trade on Reliance, Ashish. So I think Reliance is looking strong only, and uh, since the, the way it has been hitting an all-time high, I think stock is poised for a move towards 1650, 1670. Uh, keeping 1540 as a trading stop loss is what I would recommend for going long into Reliance. And even uh, you know, uh, Neeraj was asking a question on on telecom space. So I think Bharti Airtel is something which is looking very, very promising on the 10%. on the you chart. Buy it at yeah, this price. Uh, so the, the only thing is the question is uh, whether you know. You, but but I think what is the level which I am looking for? Uh, in 
in Bharti is close to around you know uh, 500, 490, 500 kind of area. So I think if you get it somewhere close to 470, 465, still the risk reward will be quite favorable for going long into uh, Bharti Airtel. Okay, that's cooling off a little bit as well at the end of the pre-open session. Looks like Bharti Airtel will not start off 10% higher, but maybe six, six and a half percent higher. So 470, 471, you would be comfortable initiating along at these. Uh, in, a, in a range between 465 to 470, I think yes, it's a good buy because positionally, uh, I think after a long, long consolidation, this stock has given a major breakout on weekly charts. Okay, watch out for some of those names. So Devina Suen Life is starting off about 20% lower. EID Parry has some 5% losses, but the SL Group stocks, you were right, are that big sore point. After that big gash late trade in Friday, both Z starting off weak and Dish TV in particular starting off another 4% lower. Which actually, uh, you know, let's talk about this, Ruchit. Z, would that be a short from you right now at about, you know, these sub 300 odd levels? <laughs> The near-term trend uh, definitely looks weak because during last week the price have breached its crucial support of 300 and has even given a closing below this. But the only thing is that if you take a fresh short trade over here, the stop loss would be quite high which would come around 312, 313. Uh, so I think uh, if we see any kind of pullback moves towards 300 which was our earlier support, then I think one should attempt a fresh short trade with stop loss, below uh, stop loss above 314. But not at current levels of 291. Okay, uh, just some updates uh, before we tell our viewers uh, or before we ask Avinash Gorakshekar about some of the other stocks. Suen Life, uh, that stock is down about 20% in the pre-open session. And the reason being one of the key molecules, which is SVN 502, that missed, it, that missed its target outcome and a golden opportunity of making a large out-licensing deal. This was the driving point um, of the uptick in Suen valuations for the last six months. If you just look at the chart of Suen Life for the last few months, you will see that by and large, it has done much better than maybe some of the other pharma peers. And now, uh, look at that. One month chart is down 10% because of this downtick of 20%. Otherwise, it was on an uptick uh, three months as well. The correction has happened because of the, the downtick is because of that 20% downtick today. Otherwise, this year has gained about 12%. But all of that gets lost out or some of it gets lost out because of this 20% downtick today. So do watch out for Suen Life Sciences in the session today. It's already down 20%, but don't quite know if there is more in store. Avinash, a lot of people might think that uh, it might be a good idea to go out and initiate a contra call on Dish TV at these levels. Would you do that? Uh, no, I think Neeraj clearly, uh, you know, within the DTH space, our sense is that uh, despite the fact that, you know, uh, the stock has corrected significantly, our sense is that now competition levels within the segment have increased considerably. And I think incremental growth in terms of subscriber additions is going to be extremely tough. So I would believe that, uh, you know, considering the fact that uh, they are already pretty highly leveraged and, uh, you know, uh, losses at the bottom line have actually increased, I would be a slightly uh, be a cautious uh, investor here. And I think it's better to wait for at least one or two quarters. I think clearly uh, looking at Reliance, you know, broadband kind of initiatives, despite the fact that there's been a slow kind of uh, ramp up there, I would believe that in uh, future it's going to be directly competing with Reliance. So in terms of the competition, in terms of the cash generation, Dish TV definitely I think is a stock which possibly could underperform in the near term. All right, about 4.20 left. Uh, that was a quick call on uh, Dish TV. But... Uh uh, you know, let's also talk a little bit more and get in uh, one more voice uh, in just a few moments. Tahir Bachar will be joining us uh, to give us uh, his perspective on the direction the market could take. But, uh, you know, just one quick word from you, Ashish, whether or not we actually see some of these larger weighted names like HGFC, Axis, Kotak within the banking space, which up until now have done well, start to take a back seat in terms of a trade. See, I think if you look at Kotak, uh, clearly there has been a very strong consolidation going on the weekly charts and no signs of any weakness is being witnessed in Kotak Mandra Bank. So I think positionally it is, it is poised for a move towards 1700 to 1720 area. So I'm, I'm talking of at least uh, 90 to 100 rupees kind of uptick from current levels in Kotak Mandra Bank. Keeping 1585 as, uh, as a trading stop loss, I, I, I'm still comfortable holding on to the long positions in the in, in, this, in this stock. Okay, uh, three minutes to go. Ruchit, anything that uh, you know you feel over uh, pre-open right now, where we've seen some amount of moves coming in there. Suvin obviously being uh, you know a big downtick on the back of some news, negative news that's come in. But uh, <coughs> any other names last few, uh, last week or so? You, I know you have a Union Bank as a pick, but any other banks like a Corporation Bank or something which has done well that can sta stand a chance to do better today, this morning? 
I think uh, no, the, if you look at the Nifty PSU inde- banking index the last week certainly there has been a good outperformance would uh, certainly you know going ahead I think uh, you know, most of the names from the PSU banking space would continue this pullback move but uh, no I won't go with uh, much beaten down names uh, you know, if one has to take a fresh set certainly uh, you know, SBI, Union Bank, Bank of Baroda uh, and to an extent even Kendra Bank uh, you know, has shown a good uh, momentum with good volume so these would be the names that one should stick with within the PSU banking space. Okay, two and a half minutes left for the markets to kick start trade. Avinash, a quick fundamental call from you. Something that uh, the last seven, eight days have uh, uh, that you would be comfortable initiating uh, a fresh investment position in. No, I think uh, within the pharma space, uh, we continue to like Sun Pharma. Our sense is that now. Uh, hopefully FY21 could be a lot better and I think considering the fact that uh, you know they have focus on speciality uh, you know the uh, you know uh, segment I would believe that any dip uh, Nira should be used to accumulate the stock here uh, maybe the stock has moved up in a short time but I think looking at the kind of quarter two numbers the volume growth uh, numbers our sense is that the sector is definitely now looking attractive and within that I think they have a large exposure on the US as well as the domestic market so clearly here from a slightly medium term uh, perspective this could be a interesting stock to actually buy on every decline. Well, let's wait and watch. Uh, pharma, it's a difficult space to track. Uh, Vinash believes that Sun Pharma is a stock that you could bet on. A larger name, so relatively uh, safe as well. Uh, you won't have these maybe shocks like the way we have had in Sue and Life as well. So watch out for those names. Now, we have a minute and a 20 seconds left. So we first need to get in the top ideas and then time permitting, we'll talk about ICICI Securities too. But first, uh, top idea for the day. Ruchit, to you. you first, your top call for the morning. I would stick with Union Bank. Uh, no, PSU banking space, as I said, you know, is likely to continue this uh, northwards trajectory. So Union Bank would be my top pick to buy at current levels with stop below 56, target around 75. Uh, Ashish? Go with uh, Gujarat Gas with a, for a target of 245, 250 on upside. 200 would be my trading stop loss. This is a call for, for 5 to 7 trading sessions. Ashish, we have time, about 30 seconds. Your uh, call on ICSA Securities. Yeah, so this is looking very promising. Weekly, monthly, all chart frame stock has given a major, major breakout with strong delivery volumes. Uh, 330 would be my trading stop loss. 410 is a, is, a, is a target for at least one to two months time frame. So I'm expecting at least 18 to 20% kind of upside in ICSA Securities from current levels. Okay, uh, gentlemen, Ashish as well as Avinash, we'll let you go on that note. Thanks much for taking the time out. Uh, Ruchit, stay on. We'll just take in one opening thought from you post-market uh, open. But uh, the market's 15 seconds left for them to kick-start trade. We'll have a start which is in the green. Uh, not for the banks as much, but for the non-banking names, courtesy Reliance Industries and Bharti Airtel. Those are the two names that will help the index in the session today, predominantly Reliance. But here's how the rates are starting off. The banks will start off weaker compared to the large caps. In fact, the bank nifty is in the red now as we speak. The Sensex, about 181 points, 0.4%. The nifty too cooling off very, very rapidly, about 0.29 or 0.3%. So now, is that the case that Reliance and Bharti Airtel have cooled off from where they were? We'll just get that in a bit. Uh, but yeah, the markets are now very, very flattish, about a third of a percent or thereabouts. Uh, Bank Nifty very flat. The mid caps and the small caps should come up on your screen and I reckon there too the moves are very flat. Straight to the heat map and let's see the gains on Bharti Airtel and Reliance Industries and how they are looking. Well, Bharti still up about 7.5%, so that one has stayed strong. Bharti Infra about 5% too. Reliance has cooled off a little bit. It was showing a gain of 3%. It's now just 2.2%. Grasim gains as well about 3%, so good going there. But more red than green on the screen. JSW Steel, Indusin and Infosys are the other gainers. But look at the losers. Aisha about a percent and a half lower. Tata Motors about a percent lower. Reaction, no doubt, to the 25% drop in auto sales. Uh, yes, Bank in the red so no we were talking about will the market view this positively immediately on open yes bank is in the red uh, certainly people not quite comfortable with the investors names Bajaj finance I must say has gone under a bit of a cloud the last few days down another percent in the session today weakness in hero motor Corp, HDFC power grid etc as well so a lot of stocks looking weak it's just the telcos and Bharti Airtel in particular which is looking very very strong very quickly before I hand it over to Devina since we are talking about telecom can't not mark today what's happening to Vodaf- what would be happening to Vodafone Idea and Grassim and the likes as well. 17.5% for Vodafone Idea, Grassim about 2.5% up in the session and Devina was talking about the Adani Group stocks. I think those are the key winners in Friday's session. Let's see these names and what they are doing in the session today. All of these were active in Friday and were hitting fresh highs, life highs, Adani Transmission, Adani Green as well as Tube Investments, not an Adani Group stock but was hitting life highs, starting off slightly flattish. But Devina, 
Uh, you're right, Reliance has cooled off and it's taken the markets along with it. Very, very flat moves now. Yeah, Vodafone Idea is up 27% now. So that's a really bumper move. Remember, the stock has come from levels of sub 3 rupees to about 8.5 now with targets of 12 rupees being placed on the stock on the back of a 3.2 time rise in EBITDA because of this price hike. But the stock continues to do well. Uh, <clears throat> fluctuating though. In terms of other movers, you've got the likes of Ajagran Prakashan, which has moved up 7%. Magma Fincorp continues to do well. Last seven days, the stock has gained 40%. And that continues to do uh, well. Gayatri Projects is up um, at 3.5%. You've got uh, the likes of uh, an HDIL, a smaller name there. MTNL back in the green then. The stock's moved up 3.5%. Then you've got the likes of... Um, <clears throat> of a Dish TV, which is 2.5% higher. JSW Energy was moved up. JSW Steel has moved up. Escorts is up 1.5%. Raymond does well, about closer to a percent or so higher. BF Utilities, um, and then you've got uh, some of the smaller banks doing okay. IDFC First Bank, which is closer to up 1% uh, higher. Ojeevan Financial Services is up 1%. Remember, uh, Ojeevan Small Finance Bank opens uh, you know, today, so that's something important to keep uh, a watch on. Uh, losers. Uh, Suvan Life, big 15% knock on the back of the negative news. Uh, then you've got the likes of uh, an Indiables Real Estate down 3%. Indiables Housing Finance should pull up. Indiables Ventures as well. Uh, GMR Infra looks weak. City Union Banks down about 2 odd percent in the session. All of the other Indiables Group stocks are looking weak in trade. But that's what we've got in terms of a market open. Pretty even keel in terms of the broader market space as well. And what we're uh, doing this morning is so 584 stocks advanced uh, versus just about 539 stocks uh, which are declining. Bringing in Tahir Bacha, see, uh, he will be joining us in just a few moments from now. But Neeraj, looks like uh, you know flat start for the day, but uh, individual stocks and just uh, primarily telecom and focus. Yeah, well, Yes Bank, by the way, is down 3% as well, but Telecom is certainly in focus because Bharti Airtel is now up 9.5%. We're talking about the others, but this one started off high and has trended higher. This has been a really good start for Bharti Airtel. So just one final call from Ruchit on that. Bharti, uh, Ruchit, 485, uh, what do the charts suggest? I mean, I'm not asking whether it's a buy or a sell. The risk reward may not be in favor, but what are the targets that the charts are telling you for Bharti Airtel? So Neeraj, uh, no, we spoke that you know, this uh, stock has formed a bullish flag pattern and today the breakout from that pattern is with a gap up opening. And uh, it's, it was not only a, a gap up opening in pre-opening session, but you can clearly see a follow-up move as well. So as per that flag pattern, the targets are coming around 514 rupees. So I think maybe today itself uh, we could see that uh, levels around 514 are getting tested. But uh, certainly as per the pattern, these are the levels that I would uh, watch for. So any existing long portion should be held on for targets of 514. Okay. We leave it at that, Rusha. Thanks very much for joining us. Bharti Airtel 483 on the stock right now at Open. Tahir Bacha, CIO of Equities at Investor Mutual Fund, is joining us right now on the show. Tahir, thanks very much for taking out the time. Uh, you know, let's let's get a sense of what you believe the markets are likely to do and whether or not you know the negative noise that we're getting with regards to you know macro indicators, global uh, uncertainty that we are facing right now. Though the equity markets are doing absolutely fine for themselves but just uh, the trade tensions you know brexit everything else that's possibly uh, the reason why you could see some bit of turbulent moves what's the gauge and what's the investment idea and strategy now So, well, I would think, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically, I think, uh, obviously, as we know, markets are forward-looking and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, at some level, it is also about expectations versus reality. And I think uh, in the last six, eight months, uh, we've been having uh, quite a tough atmosphere in terms of many issues, uh, either globally as well as uh, uh, especially with respect to the domestic market, particularly with uh, regard to the banking and financial services space. And I think uh, incrementally, if you look at it uh, from uh, where we were, let's say, in October, November last year to now, and some of the uh, uh, big fears and anxieties which were there in the market, I think one by one, gradually, things seem to be receding. Uh, not to say that everything is uh, hunky-dory and every problem has been solved, but I think uh, the expectation that the NBFC crisis would probably become a lot worse and, uh, you know, the domino effects... Uh, and the collateral damages would be substantially higher. I think that has not necessarily played out. I think some of the uh, issues with regard to some of the entities which were in stress is gradually getting resolved as they are able to kind of raise, uh, are coming closer, if at all, to raising money. 
So the uh, system seems to be settling down. We also probably had a situation where government response was uh, uh, not as strong. I think this time around, uh, in the last few months, we've seen a reasonably better action out of the government. Uh, not that there are a lot of big bang reforms, but I think quite a number of policy measures seem to look like uh, uh, you know, they're all constructive, they're all uh, well-intentioned, they, they should add up to something. Of course, uh, there is the corporate tax cut to which in the meanwhile uh, supports earnings. So I think uh, we're kind of getting out of the uh, very tough groove that we were in uh, uh, a few quarters ago. Uh, it's still going to be a arduous journey, but uh, I think market, like as I said, is uh, banking on incremental. And last but not the least, I think the global liquidity situation and the domestic liquidity situation will continue to kind of drive markets, uh, at least in the near term. Tahir, hmm. do you expect 2020 as a year to be much better than what we've gone through in uh, you know, 2019? But the period you know, from September 2018 to September 2019 has been a really rough ride for the equity markets. Um, you know, pain points across the board, um, not just the banking system. Now, though, you could expect a little bit of recovery for some of these bigger banks, and that could uh, spur some more interest back into them. But as a year, 2020, do you think we turn a new page? I would think so. I think quite a number of some of the measures which have been taken in the recent past uh, will kind of uh, play out gradually. I wouldn't use the term much better, but I think it will probably be a better year compared to 2019. Uh, we will obviously see base effect. Uh, we will see, um, uh, you know, uh, liquidity in the system uh, kind of uh, uh, helping growth come back. I think NBFC is after a very uh, sharp 30-35% uh, contraction. Uh, uh, should kind of uh, settle down. We'll obviously see uh, a differentiation between uh, NBFCs and NBFCs, but uh, I think the system will probably revert back to some normalcy of growth. And uh, I, I, at one level, NBFCs do, I mean, if, if they get the liquidity and uh, you know uh, they, are, they are able to uh, borrow in the market, I think it, they will drive demand. So in case of NBFC-related growth, supply creates its own demand, and I think uh, uh, some part of the demand um, uh, erosion that we saw in the 2019 year uh, was to do with the supply impact at the NBFC level. So, so yes, I would in totality, I would probably think that uh, it's a bit of a risk on market um, uh, from a global standpoint as well as uh, uh, you know uh, from a domestic uh, perspective. We should see um, things settling down. Consumer sentiment uh, can probably get better and. We're kind of hoping that you know we will see some bit of spark out of the rural markets as well as uh, uh, as food inflation becomes a little more beneficial to uh, rural incomes and uh, you know government spending in the rural areas becomes a lot more supportive. Tahir, uh, you know, I just want to uh, get your view on how you. So you know, a few months ago, we actually saw a period of peak polarization where the weightage of the top Nifty 50 stocks hit highs of about 64 percent versus the bottom 35 stocks. Now that historically has been a turning point where you know you in the, the rally that um, follows this period of peak polarization, you have the bottom 35 stocks starting to move up and a backseat being taken by the top 10 drivers. Uh, we've started to see that happening. So from the peak weightage of 64%, it's come down to about 62% already. Do you see that uh, you know, probably unfolding in a, in, a, in a more larger fashion, where you see a bigger impact from the bottom 35 stocks? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, this, it's all a function of uh, where we are in the overall growth cycle. And I think if uh, the overall economic growth cycle were to become a little more uh, broad-based, uh, and which is what I would probably think uh, will likely happen in 2020, I think uh, uh, it's, a, it's a fair game that you know the markets will broaden uh, and uh, I mean, why should investors just chase 10% uh, uh, stocks, 10% uh, growth stocks at 50, 60 multiples if there are uh, opportunities uh, wherein you can probably see either similar growth or uh, probably slightly better growth, maybe at half or one fourth of the multiples. So it uh, it's it's going to be a um, rebalancing for sure at uh, some level as we see, uh, and it's happened in the past. It's not that it is something which has not happened. We've seen it. Uh, as late as two years back when there was a substantial rally in mid and small caps. And at that time, large caps uh, valuations were not as high. So I think uh, that, that mean reversion uh, is uh, more or less a given. And I think the right triggers would obviously be the, uh, the recovery in the growth cycle. So yes, uh, this will start coming down. As you rightly said, we're already starting to see that. So probably if I were to look at data on the last uh, one year basis, there is still a big large difference between the large cap and mid small cap performance. 
Well, I think when we zoom it down to the last three months, we see probably parity uh, within uh, performance of large, mids, and small. So I think uh, it's starting to happen. It's in the early stages, but uh, it should uh, probably unfold a lot more further in, uh, in the course of 2020. Watch out, Bajaj Finance is down about 2.5%, is the second worst performer on the Nifty 50 today. We're talking about uh, the heroes of the last rally, just starting to take a bit of a pullback from 4 to 5, 0 or thereabouts. This one is now at 3982, despite a very successful QIP. Just some money uh, getting rotated. Tahir, good morning. Neeraj here. Um, Tahir, the tide seems to morning. be turning for Thank some you. specific pockets in a meaningful way and can't not discuss telecom here. What is your view, Tahir? Do you think that after the news is out of the bag, but maybe some of the impacts still to be felt for the next few quarters fundamentally, is there merit in trying to own any of the telcos? Well, so as far as the telcos go, I think we've been... Uh, uh, backing the story now for probably about uh, maybe two, three quarters. And I think uh, 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 for us, the premise was obviously this, that you know, uh, beyond a particular point, uh, pricing was becoming unsustainable. And uh, uh, you know, there would be a certain amount of uh, expectation of returns for most telcos uh, on their investments. Um, and uh, conditions were getting uh, you know, uh, ripe for that. But obviously, we didn't know as to how it would manifest itself and uh, how it would play out and with what intensity. So I think uh, what is currently happening is not uh, uh, exactly out of line of our expectations when we, uh, when we started to look at these names. Uh, they have done a fair bit in the recent past, so, and they are responding to some of the uh, uh, recent announcements. and. Uh, uh, the changes to the pricing structure. I think uh, obviously there is room for uh, price increases to happen uh, further as well, but it's a fairly large quantum immediately. We need to see at the ground level how customer response is and uh, um, you know what eventually is the kind of uh, benefits which accompany some of these price increases. So uh, we'll, we'll, uh, from here on, I think it is important to allow the system to stabilize and see what the net impact is. Uh, you know, uh, these are ultimately not businesses which will not have any uh, capital intensity. Um, uh, somewhere down the line, uh, spectrum-related, um, you know, investments, etc., will probably once again come back into play. Uh, maybe not immediately, perhaps f uh, four to six quarters down the line. So one has to brace for that as well. But yes, it does give a lot of uh, comfort to many of these telcos to come out of the hole. Uh, improve their balance sheets, uh, and uh, you know, uh, markets are uh, have responded a fair bit to uh, some of these invest, uh, some of these developments as well. Mm. Tahir, the other question is on uh, PSUs of the divestment theme, and I want to understand what a large CIO of uh, of a large mutual fund managing public money would do. I've spoken to a number of private investors who are saying that they would tactically allocate some capital to divestment, citing what happened in 2004 when Arun Shori announced that disinvestment plan, and now we have a firm disinvestment plan in place. Is there merit in putting money to work in the government-owned entities? Well, there is merit um, in uh, putting uh, money to work uh, uh, irrespective, I mean, provided you create a decent quality portfolio out of uh, um, the PSU basket. So it is uh, just like as it works in the private sector space, I mean, even in, within the PSU, you have to be selective about the kind of companies that you, um, you know, build into your portfolio. Uh, as you know, we run one of the, perhaps the only two, or two uh, uh, PSU funds which are uh, available in the market today. and. Uh, we've uh, managed to uh, kind of uh, uh, run this portfolio reasonably successfully over the last many years. Um, uh, you know, so to that extent, I think, uh, uh, and it's it's a large part of it is due to the way the portfolio has been structured and the stock selection has happened. So uh, we can't take away that from the equation, uh, despite the fact that, uh, yes, I would agree that uh, there is merit at this stage, uh, given the fact that, uh, uh, you know, there are two, three things that work for PSUs. Obviously, the fact that, uh, uh, government, um, uh, you know, plans around strategic disinvestment, etc., should probably help uh, 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 some bit of re-rating in PSUs. Uh, it gives you a chance to probably participate in many of the core sectors in the economy. And uh, like as I said, if you're probably looking at uh, possible economic revival in the next uh, uh, couple of years, then uh, clearly many of the PSU businesses would uh, uh, stand to benefit out of that. And uh, more recently, I think we've seen. Uh, 
quite a number of new unique uh, businesses uh, emerge uh, through IPOs, etc., in the PSU space, uh, which uh, provide for um, you know an opportunity to own uh, some uh, some of these, and uh, uh, many of them do tend to be you know monopolies, virtual diop uh, virtual monopolies or duopolies in many of their businesses. So I think. Uh, 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 we can't take away the fact that you know stock specific uh, stock selection is uh, of uh, uh, you know vital importance uh, as far as uh, uh, the running of the PSU is uh, concerned. But uh, I think uh, uh, you know if you uh, get that equation right, uh, they can at least give you a 10 percent kind of earnings growth in the base case. Uh, so without re-rating as well, I think um, uh, you know early double digit return is uh, possible, and uh, that is probably something that we've kind of been able to deliver in the recent past. <clears throat> Bharti Airtel is now up about seven and a half percent, with Z uh, being up in the session by three, three and a half or percent, and Reliance too up about three and a half percent. Tahir, one last word uh, from you with regards to any portfolio rebalancing in terms of sector weighted changes that you would recommend. I, like as I said, I mean we have, uh, and we've been saying this for now some time, so it's not something that I'm, uh, uh, you know, saying uh, something new which I'm saying. But uh, uh, yes, I mean we've had this preference for mid and small caps for a fairly decent period now for the last almost a year. Not that I, that it has necessarily worked out for us as much, but I think it is beginning to work, uh, and we we are continuing to kind of you know uh, uh, see value in some of these uh, in many of these uh, cases, and uh, we're happy to kind of bite into them. Uh, I can only say that you know, 75, 80 percent of our incremental ideation of our out of our out of our teams uh, in the last one year has come out of mid and small cap. So it just tells you where the comfort lies as far as uh, uh, even ideas out of our analyst desks uh, is concerned. So that is one. But from a sector perspective, I don't really think we have. Uh, you know, uh, I still have a s case where there is. Uh, 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 a few sectors which significantly appeal to us. We have uh, we have individual opportunities across uh, several sectors which are which are exciting. So I wouldn't exclude uh, um, either uh, defensives or the FMCGs or any of that um, in order to you know only prefer some of the uh, beta names or you know the the more the ones which are linked to probably the industrial or growth cycle. But we we have a balanced approach uh, to these kind of things uh, with regard to our uh, portfolio conduct, and I think we will continue on that uh, uh, balance. But uh, we are seeing a lot more individual opportunities across uh, different kinds of sectors, uh, uh, bottom up, so to speak, and uh, that's the way to go. Okay, Tahir, thanks very much for joining us. Really appreciate your time this morning. Pleasure. Thanks very much. All right, moving on, Ujjivan Small Finance Bank's IPO opens for subscription today. A few months too late for the RBI's liking, but the issue has some prominent anchor investors. Shifali Malik's here to tell us more about the IPO. Shifali. Well, the IPO starts today and it ends on December 4, and it has been priced at about 36 to 37 rupees a piece. Uh, and uh, it's a fresh issue, uh, so um, uh, it's a fresh issue. So the offer for sale is about 15 to 16 percent, and the proposed fund raises to the tune of about 750 crores. Remember, they've already raised about 250 crores in a pre-IPO placement. And how the issue is placed in terms of allocation: the for qualified institutional buyers, it's 75 percent; for non-institutional buyers, it's about 15 percent, and retail investors 10 percent and after that uh, how uh, the bank has been doing in last couple of years we've already been tracking the bank actively because uh, the parent company is uh, listed that is Ujjivan Financial Services so uh, they started off as a microfinance player but over last couple of years as you can see their share of micro banking is coming down from 98 percent which it was in FI 17 to about 79 percent now and the share of non microfinance banking has risen to 21 percent from just 2% in FI17. So uh, that's what their strategy has been after turning into a small finance bank, that is diversification. In terms of uh, absolute numbers, uh, advances, they've grown from 7,000 to 12,864 crores. That is a CAGR of uh, 
15 percent in last three years and at the end of H1 they stand at about 12,864 and deposit CAGR has been to the tune of about 24 percent in last three full financial years and at the end of first half it stands at about 10,130 uh, uh, odd crores and uh, also um, so in terms of the asset quality their asset quality is pretty strong in fact there's been a continuous improvement from as high as about 3.6 percent in terms of gross NPS in FY17 they've brought it down to 0.85 percent at the end of uh, uh, first half of FY19 and another endeavor of theirs have uh, been has been uh, to bring down the cost of funds uh, by focusing on the retail deposits which now form about 41 percent even though the CASA ratio looks a little less about 11 odd percent and what's the peer comparison like uh, well, I've compared it to a couple of players, hardcore microfinance players and also a couple of uh, banks. Uh, so in terms of comparison, their return on net worth in FY19 for G1 small finance bank stands at about 11.5%, Bandhan 18.96%, Equitas, which is the closest peer, 7.5%. Credit access, Grameen and AU small finance bank are a bit on the higher side. So, uh, so rightly justified in terms of price to book, they command a little lesser price to book at about 2.5%. Nine times, and in comparison to some of the other more diversified banks as well, like DCB Bank and RBL Bank, etc., because they also have some exposure to MFI and MSME, which they've been trying to focus on. So the valuation looks uh, pretty okay in in terms of comparison uh, to the peers. But one comparison which also comes in is with the listed entity of Jeevan Financial Services, because um, there that's uh, obviously been commanding a bit of a holding company discount, rough calculations around 15%. So either you can go for that or this but the existing one is actually currently available at a discount okay um, Shefali thanks so much for putting that into perspective that's with regards to the IPO that is open today we take a break on the note that the markets are well flattish for the time being uh, a third of a percent and nothing too much and that is courtesy Reliance Industries but coming up we discuss how DLF plans to beat the real estate slowdown with CFO Ashok Tyagi